So uh, let me welcome you to tonight's program. And, and really, uh, as we began to talk about, it's hard for me to imagine that in schools today that this is a, the issue that it is. You know, 40 years into my career, um, spending as much time as we do around, which we need to, by the way, security. And we feel incredibly fortunate, as I have since I've been here. And, uh, I'm not sure everybody knows, but uh, our directors of security here at the school are uh, Bob Meals and John Zellick. We want you to have a sense of that, and we have a good cross-section. And uh, before they actually say anything, I, I can't tell you over the, during, my, the, during my tenure here, I've had the privilege to get to know he was not a captain at the time, but Cap Captain Thomas and uh, you know uh, uh, Deputy Chief McGuire from the fire department incredibly well because of how helpful they have been to us in many other schools. And they're going to spend much of the night, or they're going to do lead much of the discussion on some levels. But the questions will come from you in just a few minutes. But before I do that, I know he has not had a very good day, but I do want to wish him a happy birthday, Dr. Kinsella. <laughs> How old are you, Dr. Kinsella? Uh, 43. I was once 43. Um, so welcome, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, what we're going to do is to spend a few minutes talking about some of our procedures uh, and processes. And then we're going to have an opportunity here a little bit from the captain and from deputy chief. And we're going to open it to questions. But I promise you that you are not the only people associated with our school or others that have issues about security. Or more importantly, really concerns about the safety of our kids. And those of you who don't know, uh, Mike Hill just walked in, is the director of security at Swarthmore. Uh, and we're hoping he'll have a few things to say tonight, yeah, too. Right there, right? <laughs> so that's right, always pass the buck, Mike. Uh, but as, as he and I have talked about this, is that there's nothing harder than guaranteeing the safety of people in the community, no matter how hard we work at it. So for example, Oh, I don't know how many years ago it is that we made our doors, that we locked our doors and created, 15 years ago? Just after 9-11. And so since that time, of course, our students, our parents, uh, others need to be buzzed in. And interestingly enough, of course, uh, the systems work in terms of buzzing in only as well as the people doing it. And that includes on all counts. But let me review our system for adults as you know it, and I hope that this is what happens. We know that sometimes we may fall short, and if we do, we need to know it. So anytime an adult comes to a door and you buzz, and in any door, what you don't know is that our assistants have monitors watching you. Do people know that? So if they haven't turned, I'm looking at, at Marin right now, if they haven't turned and looked specifically at you, it's not because they can't see you. It's because they're looking down at the monitor and they're, in theory, able to identify you. Now, can they identify why you're there or no? But in theory, you then go to the front desk. And when you go to the front desk, who knows what's supposed to happen then? Anybody? And how do you get that badge? You hand your license. Do you know the license goes through a system called the Raptor system? Does anybody know what the Raptor system is actually evaluating? When? Um, child abuse. Yeah, any child abuse or sexual uh, crime. Your name, if your name shows up on that, then immediately, you know, we're aware of it. And at that particular point, one of our directors of security called, and we deal with it accordingly. And we follow the law and all of those kinds of things. But it doesn't identify other crimes. The system is meant to protect children in the context of that. So there's nothing in terms of violence or those things that we'd know of. 
Does that make sense? And then once you get your visitor pass, you're able to go to the places you're supposed to. Now, in theory, if you don't have your visitor pass on, somebody should identify that and should let us know so that we then deal. Now, when that's happened, understandably, people say, but this is supposed to be a friendly school, which we think we are. On the other hand, the balance of offsetting it with safety is fundamentally important. And in theory, you wear that visitor's pass to wherever you're going, and if you were going up to the upper school, for example, someone would meet you, take you to the office, bring you back down. Or if you're going to a meeting in the common room, similarly. And then we pick up the visitor's pass when you leave. I am curious, if you've been in the school, how many of you have at least experienced that? Good. One. And then, Steve, and then what's happened since then? They say hi because they know who you are. So, so let me tell you is that once your name is in the Raptor system and you've been run through, then if you are appropriately identified, you don't have to go back through the Raptor system. But, but you should still have on a visitor's pass, even though we know you. So we have spent a significant amount of time talking and revisiting our policies about that particular piece with everyone, for example, who's at the reception desk and our entire central administrative team and everyone in the school. But there are going to be times where it doesn't work as well as we think it should. And when that's the case, we, we need to know that because we spend a lot of time on this particular issue. Obviously, with the hope that there's never going to be a concern. And, and as a head of school, and, and the captain's been particularly helpful with this, our systems are really, really good. And I, and I say what I'm going to say, not to put fear in anyone's place, but the challenge is if there's either a break in the system, is that the systems, the door systems here and in other places, if I'm wrong on this, please speak up, tend to keep the honest people out. If you had someone who really wants to do damage in any institution, though I hate to admit it, they can find a way into a building. And interestingly, in schools, whether I like to admit it or not, for people who know the data associated with violence, the greatest percentage of those crimes are done by whom? People associated with the school. So that creates two different things. One is a much easier way in as a rule of thumb because they know the school, as happened, by the way, down in Florida, and as has happened in most of the schools that I'm aware of. And at the same time, many of them could be buzzed in because they're part of the school. We don't have metal detectors at our doors. We are not going to arm, we are not going to arm our teachers or other people. There's a certain amount of faith and understand that even if we did, we would not have any more confidence that it would prevent the kinds of things that we're talking about. So when we get to the discussions and Again, uh, both the captain and the deputy chief will speak to this. If, God forbid, something happens, it's about minimizing the impact of what happens and maximizing the chance that the most people in the community are going to be safe. And ironically, by the way, when these things happen, everybody's concern jumps for good reason. Right? Did anybody not become more concerned after Parkside? We, we all are. We all are. Here's the irony to it, is that if that's the only time that we address these issues, we'd really have a problem. You'd have to worry. But as I think you'll hear the captain and the deputy chief say, this is an area that we spent a lot of time on. For example, We've run first responder drills here for years. And before this event ever happened, we already had one scheduled for next fall. Now, why do you schedule them so far in advance? They're hard to do. They're complex. They take our whole system, and they take 
the systems, the police and fire who are going to be involved and everybody working together. And it's a terrific drill to go through and one you hope you never have to do. But so he's going to talk a little bit about that tonight. I think he's going to mention it. But I want you to bear in mind that we had it scheduled before anything happened at Parkside. Just as we have done and will continue to do our fire drills. By the way, we do fire drills on average of once a month, as you're required to. And we do those really well. And fortunately, there has not been a fire in the country in how many years is it? An over, well, let's say a significant amount of time, about 100 years. He can check that in a school that has caused a death. But we will continue to do those. But in addition, we have other drills that we do. You know, I won't go through the specifics of them, though they may come up later tonight. But one of the things that we're being helped with is a review of all of our processes. So, for example, one of our fundamental responses has been when there's been a concern, and this is not per se about a shooter, but about someone in the building that you have concern about, we've gone to lockdown drills and practiced them on an ongoing basis. Now, does everybody know what a lockdown drill is? Let, let me note it just for a second. If a lockdown drill occurs, you want to get out of the public areas into a space that hopefully will lock and that you're able to block with as many sort of things as possible, completely out of sight. Locked doors and those kinds of things. Now, one of the things in schools that happens is that we have such a range in our buildings and the range in the age of our kids that the response to given situations are going to vary depending on location, depending on kids, depending on situation. So when you hear the captain tonight and you hear the deputy chief, bear in mind that the things are situational. And again, their job is to help us keep as many people as safe as we possibly can if something happens. And if something does happen, to minimize the impact on the community until response has taken place and eliminated the problem. Does that make sense? Now, what you got to see in Florida is a young man who really knew the system, right? I mean, you have to think about it. Pulled a fire alarm, knew exactly what was going to happen, and found a way to walk out with people. It doesn't usually happen that way. The greatest percentage of perpetrators from that kind of situation are stopped one way or another. And it's not unusual for them to have taken their own lives at the end of that kind of a siege and or to have been met by the police or someone else and all. So the situation turned out, I think, to be highly unusual in some regards, but it's one that only increases the fear that we all have. One of the things we have worked hard at here at Shipley is to make our campus as welcoming as we can. It's one of the reasons that a significant part of our commons is glass, which is absolutely terrific in terms of the goal of being welcoming and a challenge in terms of potential vulnerability. And rules there are different than some other places in terms of response. But people won't remember this, but when 9-11 happened, and that's when we really began working in a whole different way with the police department and the fire department. We had just opened our lower school building. It's 15 plus years ago. And we had spent years making it the kind of welcoming facility we wanted. And then for about three months after it, we just kept looking at the makeup of the building, of the, of the construction of the building, and wondered the same questions. Now, fortunately, these kind of tragedies, though they are much more frequent than they have ever been, which is a real concern, are still relatively few in nature in terms of places that they've actually happened. But it doesn't mean that we should not be remarkably diligent 
about all of the things that we do do. And so it's in that context that we've invited the captain and the deputy chief to say a few words and for all of us to be able to answer questions for you as we go. So at this particular point, what I'm, what I'm going to do, if it's OK, is everybody understand what, what I've had to say so far? Any questions on any of it? Yes. Uh, we've, we've had, <laughs> yes, easy answer is yes, uh, and you can ask, uh, we've had two or three already, uh, and the challenge, and by the way, in theory, uh, everybody should be wearing an ID when they're in school, and, and by the way, I took mine off a little while ago, but all of us should too, you know, we've said that, and we understand that, and it's actually interesting, is, is Anna here by chance? This is one of the challenges across the school. It's not, by the way, lower school doesn't wear IDs, but as we move to middle school is actually the best about it, and upper school is a greater challenge associated with it. And it's an interesting thing is, it, yes, they're supposed to wear it, and yes, we respond when we know that they don't for appropriate, you know, we give them a time, you know, one day, and then in principle, you know, they could have a detention or something like that, or, you know, but the reality is, if one of them comes without her, her badge, you know, or her ID, or his ID, somebody else will open the door for him because they'll identify him. And, 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 and let me say this, by the way. Your question is a good one and an important one. Whether or not the student has an ID, right, is not going to increase or decrease the chance of someone doing something crazy. And we have no idea when a student enters the building. Well, let's be realistic what they're carrying and what they're not. My question is, is, is more about students letting other people in. Because, if, for example, there's a kid who has a badge that used to be a chip and I don't know if he was expelled or if he was asked to leave, but his family has guns and he is dating a girl in high school. Yeah, so, so you know, So those are two different things. What you just described is a person who's not a student here. And we've gone over it quite seriously about the implications. And in theory, now I'm not going to know whether someone opened it or not, but in theory our students understand the importance of it and have committed in principle not to open the door. But the system is only going to be, you know, you know, so but, but rest assured, was, how many times have we reiterated it since, since the port? And the kids get it, by the way. The kids understand that. So, but it only, unfortunately, it only takes one student or one adult to open the door for someone. You know, and that's a problem. Steve. And then. Sure. So you mentioned, obviously, that a lot of times there's people who are familiar with the school or part of the community, which I agree with you. What can we do, though, to try to minimize that risk? Well, we'll, we'll, well, first of all, <laughs> that, thank you for the question. That's actually much more complex than BART, and it isn't simply about knowing whether or not people are carrying weapons, but it's one of the reasons that we pay such strong attention to sort of what I'm going to say, the psychological welfare of our community. It's one of the reasons why uh, we have jumped to reinforce the education of the whole child and positive education, not because it solves the part. Uh, how many of you in the middle or upper school had your, your children, first, if you gave permission for, to have a test administered to see how they measured on places of anxiety and depression? And think, not everybody, but everybody could. And we use that data point, not to say they're going to carry guns, that's not it. But if a student shows an, a higher score on one of, in one of those areas, 
that suggests a potential challenge. Again, not per se about violence, but about concerns. Our support staff is then meeting with the parents of those kids and their strategies about how you deal with those things and all that goes with it. But, you know, psychological welfare, this is one of the challenges. If you read about the tragedy in Florida or followed it or something that happened in a library up in Winchester, Massachusetts, which I look at comparably, they were kids, people who showed signs of potential issues, and then it's what becomes of them. So in our case, we work really closely with parents and professionals to do the very best we can, and if we get to a place where we believe someone is a risk in the community, then she or he uh, isn't here. Yeah, no, the only thing we can do is no. And if there's a former student, in, again, a former student who's been here and been disinvited, I, if someone, ha someone should not have let him or her into the building and would have to have come to the front desk, and that's where we have the potential to deal with it. Do we have a way to monitor social media? <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, you know what? No, 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 Steve, is the right question, but, you know, let me ask you a question. Social media. We're going to have the resources to monitor every kid's social media that's coming around. Uh, the good thing about social media is usually it's shared, and some kid will pick up on it and show their parents, and that's usually how we get notified. That, by the way, the single most powerful group in the school and the way we get kids, either here or who aren't, the most possible help, you know how? Yeah. Their peers, their peers, and you want to tell your kids this, if you have concerns about people, whether it's students, adults, whatever, you want them to talk to members of our team so we're aware of it, and it helps. Marin, and then, uh, Marin, and then we're gonna open it. Say that again. Need this. Um, no, we're actually taping this so people know. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, the Commons is an awkward position because the students who have been told, and they all know, don't let anybody in, which is great. You guys have done a really good job communicating. I've heard from all three of my kids. They say don't let anybody in. But then let's say me, who's a fairly uh, familiar face around campus, I come to the Commons, I can't get in because there's nobody staffing the desk. So I do the knock on the door, and I, which I see everybody else do. I feel terrible, and a you know student you know tiptoes over, lets me in. Is there a reason that the all well, three the, academic it's, buildings it's, are very well manned? Well, and actually the commons is staffed until uh, is it four by till six o'clock? Yeah, it's very sporadic, yeah. and I'm not trying to yeah, tell that's okay. On anybody, that's okay, but, it's okay, but it is sporadic. it is staffed. So in theory, you should be able to be buzzed in. But we'll we'll check that. Please. You know, if you haven't. If you haven't met James, who's there all the time, James Stewart, and, there, and then he's replaced by security and other people, uh, that, you know, we've been very careful. We're, I'm going to hold the questions up, because what I want to do is, and we'll come back to them, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll answer as many questions as people have. What I'm going to ask is, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Captain Thomas to say a few words and open it to questions, and perhaps uh, to have uh, 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 Deputy Fire Chief say a few words, okay? So, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my name is Frank Thomas. I've been a police officer with Lower Marion for 30 years. I'm the uh, captain of uh, the operations division, which is basically all the cops you see on the street, all the CSI stuff you watch on TV. I'm in charge of that. Um, how many township residents do I have here? Okay. And then the rest of you, you have some buy into this too, because obviously your kids go here or you work here. Um, not to plug Lower Marion too much, but people don't realize how large our operation is. Hereford has approximately 60, 70 officers. Radner's in the 30s and 40s. We have 136 officers in Lower Marion Township. We're a, a, a full-service police department, uh, very service-oriented. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is that 
we uh, are very proactive when it comes to the active shooter and, and the safety of our schools. Uh, myself, I spent 15 years on the SWAT team. People probably don't even realize Lower Marion has a SWAT team. You have a SWAT team in Lower Marion. Uh, I'm a rapid deployment instructor, and uh, so that's where my background comes in this. Uh, that's the plug for Lower Marion. Now, you're going to think this is a, a paid endorsement of Shipley, but it's not. I have no kids here. I don't get paid by Shipley School. I just have this experience, and I truly mean this from the heart. Uh, Shipley School has been so far out in front of this compared to every other school, public or private, in this township. And not to put them down, but just to, to praise Shipley, uh, Dr. Pilch and his team have been excellent over the years. This is the first school that we ever were allowed to do an active shooter drill at. And that was about eight years ago. And then we did a second one, and uh, we worked closely with them. Uh, very, and again, this is not a paid endorsement, just the fact. They're very proactive with the, the security measures, uh, the system for scanning for IDs uh, that was in place here before anybody else. Simple things like num numbering the doors. So when we're in these schools and we get turned around, I could say on the radio, I'm at door you know, B12, and they can look on a map and know exactly where I'm at. Little things like that they have taken to heart and, and have really been proactive over the last decade in, in getting this stuff established. So kudos to them. They, they deserve the recognition for that. As far as Lower Marion, uh, for rapid deployment, does everyone have a concept of what that is? Basically, after Columbine, not to get too far in the weeds with this, but Columbine, uh, an officer chased those two guys to the door and stopped, right? And then hundreds of police officers crowded outside because at, at that time, that was a SWAT job. That was too dangerous for patrol. Klebold and Harris had 47 minutes alone in that school with the kids while the police officers all stood outside. We, in my profession, my peers, we look at each other, even though it wasn't a defined program at the time, we look at each other and I wasn't in the position, but we, we, I hope that I would have went in that, in that school and went after him, that officer didn't. So after that, what came of that is rapid deployment. Uh, it shifted from uh, an active shooter type uh, event from patrol, or from a SWAT team to patrols. Now every officer in Lower Marion is trained in rapid deployment. And what that means is you're not waiting for the SWAT team. You're not waiting for a supervisor. If God forbid we show up at this door and we hear shots coming from inside or we get reports of shots inside of any building in this township, the officers are going to go in, two four-man teams, whoever's there, they're going to go. And the main purpose is to stop the shooter. And then after that, we train very hard. We learned some additional lessons through uh, Virginia Tech and Fort Hood. Uh, additional teams come in. All of our officers are trained in, in battle, f battle wound uh, care, for lack of a better term. Uh, with tourniquets, we're all, uh, uh, we all have that equipment on us and in our cars, so we can uh, start uh, rendering immediate aid. We also train very closely with Narberth ambulance. So they're medics. In the past, before, before Virginia Tech, medics would not come into a building because it's too dangerous. After Virginia Tech, just like we learned the hard way with Columbine, now medics will come into the building if we provide proper security with them. We work very closely with Narberth Ambulance, and, and it's been a very good program. They have two ER doctors that volunteer for the ambulance, and they come in actually every year we do this for all of our personnel and do battle food, battlefield wound care for us. So I know it's not a pleasant subject. It's not what you want to hear, but I just want to in some way give you a little Confidence that your police department is here. It's professional. We have the equipment we need. We have the training we need. And we have the personnel we need. We train with Narberth Ambulance, and your school is obviously doing everything they can. Like Dr. Pilch said, though, unfortunately, we can't keep everybody out of your building. It doesn't matter what building it is. I always use the police department as an example. You have to have a card key to get into our police station, right? If I really want to get in the police station, I just have to take one of the secretaries down in the hall, or out in the parking lot, and I have, I have access to our whole building. You know, there's only one building that I've been in that is truly, truly secure. Now, it's greater for prison, but people die in there on a regular basis, too. Right? So, not to scare you, I mean, I'm available for sweet 16s and, you know, parties, whatever you... <laughs> my wife makes fun of me because I can just bring them. You want to talk terrorism, I'll have you crying as we walk out the door. Uh, but 
for the school in, in, in general, Montgomery County, everything started out uh, with lockdown drills, which is still appropriate, lockdown. Uh, after some hard lessons, again, with Virginia Tech and these different shootings that happened, uh, nationally it's coming out as run, hide, fight now. Um, you're not abandoning lockdown because that's the hide part of it. Uh, real briefly, run, hide, fight is basically, the way I try to explain this to people is the paradigm has shifted in society in this country at this point. Pre-9-11, if this was one airplane and we all squeezed in the middle and we're all sitting here and I stood up with a box cutter and told you everyone to sit down and I harmed one of the stewardesses, you all would have sat down, right? September 12th, if I did that, you all would have beat me to death, right? Because the paradigm shifted, things have changed. And that's where we're at right now with, with active shooters and school violence. It, it has shifted. So run, hide, fight, just in its basic, simplest terms is something to fall back on. It's not just for when you're in a school. We teach this, we go out to do office buildings, schools, anyone that wants to hear it, is so when something happens, you have something to fall back on. You don't rise to the occasion, you revert to your level of training. So if you're, I don't know if anybody's here old enough to remember Sylvia Seacrest in the Springfield Mall, right? She walks in the front door and starts shooting in the mall. The paradigm has shifted. Now when you're with your family, you need to have something in the back of your mind to fall back on. People got caught flat-footed. They heard gunshots, they didn't know what to do, all right? Run, hide, fight is just something simple to fall back on. If you hear gunshots, distance is your friend, run. If you can't run and you get caught, say you're in an office building and you're six floors up and bad guy's coming down the hall, you hide, you barricade. That's the barricade in place. And the fight is where everybody gets kind of caught up on. In no way, shape, or form are we saying, uh, you know, we hear gunshots right now, you three go down the hallway and assault the guy with, an, you know, with your bare hands, go down and assault a guy in the next building. That's not what we're talking about. That's our problem, that's my job. What we're talking about is if you barricaded yourself into a, a closed space and you can't leave, and the bad guy's coming through the door and you have no other option, there are no other options, fight for your life. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's the fight. And where that comes out again is at Virginia Tech. When Cho went into the classrooms and started shooting, the first classroom got caught flat-footed, they didn't have a chance. The second classroom, had college-age men and women and a teacher in it and had two or three minutes of hearing gunshots next door and they all chose to hide in the corner, hide in the corner. Some jumped out the window, but the majority of them just stayed in the room and tried to hide. Well, he came in and this guy weighed 80 pounds wet. Nobody had a plan. So run, hide, fight is just a plan. To have something to fall back on through God forbid you're ever caught in that situation. And again, it's not just for schools, it's for your businesses, it's when you're walking with your family down in the mall. If you're walking in the mall, Springfield Mall or King of Prussia Mall, and you hear a gunshot go off, that's not the time to think, what should I do if I hear a gunshot go off? You should already have in your head, if I hear a gunshot, I'm going into one of these stores, because every store has a back door that gets to the supply closet and gets out to the supply ramp. They don't carry all their merchandise down the front of the, the, the store and go into the storefront, they carry it up through the back. You get out, you have a plan, and that's the whole concept behind run, hide, fight. It's actually on YouTube too. If you just YouTube run hide fight, it comes right up. So in that context, you can appreciate the concept, but how that's going to vary in terms of how old the kids are, what building they're in, and how you're going to best maximize their safety. So for example, you're not going to have kindergartners running and fighting, right? I mean, we talked about this at length. And, and let me say this so that, and, and Kevin may say something about this, is 
some people won't know this, but the captain has been good enough over the years and is again in a couple weeks going to be retraining all of our colleagues, faculty and staff, in all of these different things to make sure that we are as aware uh, and prepared as we possibly can. So, so. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, all these things come down to it depends. Like, what if a kid comes into this specific building and it happens to be fourth graders? Well, it depends. Uh, so that's, that's why there's no one answer for everything. It's a basic concept to fall back on. Uh, high school teachers, you have a better chance of fighting, obviously, if you have a bunch of college or a bunch of football players in your room. If you're an elementary school teacher, you have a moral obligation to those kids. You're not going to run out the door on them. You're going to barricade yourself in there and make yourself as hard of a target for us to get there. And again, a fortunate thing in this school specifically, you're, you're stationed pretty much in the middle of our town. We will be here within minutes, but those minutes are going to seem like hours if you're the one hiding in the closet. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a fourth grader, mm -hmm. and I guess my question is, I sat him down and I said, if this happens, you should, you should play dead, or you should run. It's hard to hit a moving target. And then I thought, wait, we both looked at each other, and I was like, we shouldn't be saying this. So is the guidance, do what your teacher says, or, or should we be telling them, giving them the run, hide, flight? I just, I want to know what your professional opinion is on that. Because I don't want to contradict so, what the school so, saying. So, so <coughs> And both of our, and if I say something wrong, is that the, the most important thing is that there be a plan that's most appropriate. And we've been working with them about what the plans are in different places. And we would be suggesting that uh, if your kids are looking to do something other than what we are asking them to do, we increase the chance of a problem. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, uh, listen, every one of us is most concerned, you know, each of us is most concerned about our own child. But our job is to be concerned about all of our kids in every way and, and to maximize it in that regard. And, and, it's, and it's really, really, really hard. And, and, and by the way, you know, there aren't many, and this is not universal, there aren't many lower school kids whom I would tell you that the best thing to do is to run. I wouldn't tell you fighting is good for anyone. Now, if the situation is down near Holland House, and we're talking about the classes in the back end of the building, the main building, that's a different situation where we'll be exiting up and around out that they'll be trained for. So it's situational. Does that make sense? So, I'm Mars husband, obviously. And at dinner that time. You have a fourth night, grader, too? Uh, we have, I do, yeah, I do. <laughs> And um, at dinner that night when the Parkland thing was on TV, our son, who's only in fourth grade, mentioned that. And Mara was like, well, run, play dead. And I, we were like, stop. And then we got the email from someone saying, well, we, did, we do these things age appropriate. But I'm still wondering, like, my son has no idea what to do. Yep. And I know he's only in fourth grade, but I want someone to tell him what to do other than me and her who aren't law enforcement. That's my first thing. So other. let me respond to that okay. for one thing, just so you have a sense, is that we have gone through this. We have not had, fortunately, live shooters in the building. That would have a whole different meaning. Uh, but, you know, John and Bob have both gone through the drills. But one of the things that happens, and she's not here tonight, but uh, one of the police officers from town who handles these things, a response person, uh, Officer Murray, is actually going to be revisiting our lower school, our middle school, our upper school, both again in the spring. and on an ongoing basis for exactly that reason. So you'll be talking to the lower school oh, yeah. kids. Okay, unfortunately. Yeah. My other yeah. thing, it's a little off base, but you were saying it's hard to follow social media, which obviously I get that, but obviously the kids follow it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have kids, my older daughter, I have five of them over on a Friday night, they spill their guts on everything. So what is the process or policy for middle school or older kids or any of the kids if they say something, see, see something, say something, like do they know who to go to? Or are they encouraged to go to them? So the answer is, we have our division heads here. The answer is is that first we, we spend a lot of time, in a, and I'm going to tie this back to our work with uh, positive education and other areas, but we spend a lot of time with our students about the necessity to share 
uh, social media and other things that may be of concern. And if Shane gets a concern, he calls the parent almost immediately to say, hey, here's what we've heard, and there's a balance. And that happens, Margaret and other people, and it's actually very, very interesting. I am curious, how many upper school parents in the room? How many of you have a sense that you can control your kid's social media? It's really, what, so what you're relying on is that they will recognize when something's not right and will say something to help us. Yeah. Yeah, it's, by, you know, it sounds funny. We're tying it to all the other things. But uh, one of the things I, th I hope you're aware of, particularly as we move to middle and upper school, is the kids have all identified three to five people, adults in the community, whom they believe they have a relationship, a trust, but that they can go to. This is not the, the only reason for it, but it is a reason for it. Yeah. But if they don't feel that, is there a way that they can do this anonymously? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, every single one, and uh, I saw Joey, uh, you know, our counselors and Sharon have a number of kids. And, and Shane, and, you know, anybody can do it anonymously. And, they, and we go through those different processes and it's explained. But again, somebody has to be willing to say something. Yeah, they can do it by note. Yeah, yeah, they can do it. Yeah, they can do it by note. They can do it by whatever. You know, it, it's interesting. No, I just wanted to touch on the gentleman's point about what you teach your children. Um, I think it's, it's not one or the other. It can be both. I think it's fine to teach your children if you're talking about scenarios. Because, again, this is getting them to think a little bit differently about how, they, how they're going to survive or how they're going to react if something does happen. Ultimately, most people are going to look for some leadership from the adult in the room. But in the absence of that leadership, let's say something happens to that, that teacher or that parent or that whoever the leader is in the room, they're hurt, they're disabled, they're the ones who's been injured. Children are pretty resilient, so I give them the other tools to say, okay, yeah, if something does happen and there's no one there in the absence of a decision, if you hear you know, what sounds like gunfire and you can run or you can't run and you think the best idea is to play dead, you know, none of us are going to be in but that space. All, but all, all, all Mike is saying is really, it's situational. Absolutely. And you want your child, and the adults, by the way, and, and children in general are more resilient than, than, than we are as adults. But the reiteration of the training and all. Did you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Um, based, on what happened down, based on what happened down in Parkland, is there anything that you can recommend to Shipley that we do to... Uh, increase our security procedures because you know the school pretty well. Um, any recommendations? Uh, from what I've read and what I've seen, the failure down there was not on the school. The failure was on law enforcement. Um, uh, your op your opportunity to stop this from happening is with your counselors and your teachers recognizing it and and putting up the red flags where that that kid had more red flags than you know, anyone. That should have never gotten to that point. And then. Unfortunately, when it got to the point where he, uh, he made entry into the building, you had a failure, it appears at this point, of law enforcement standing outside. Um, so I don't know if that's a good example of saying how do you help the school tighten security because that was such a failure before it even got to the school that, you know, they had a school, <laughs> they had a school resource officer there when it started, and he didn't act. And I can't defend him. I wouldn't defend him based on what I know now. Can we, can we do this? Can we do this? We'll come back sure, to you. But there, go ahead in the back. I was wondering, um, I'm sorry, this is really loud. Um, will we be told what the kids are learning so we can help reinforce Say it? Say that. I'm sorry, ask Will the we question. be told what the kids are learning to the safety procedures so we can reinforce it so we're on the same page? Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll be you'll have shared with you what they've heard, some of which you've actually heard tonight. Yeah. But, uh, you know. I mean, besides just my kid telling me, I mean, a kid yeah. to a Yeah, uh, third you know, in the, in the lower school, for example, Tim will uh, put something out consistent with it. The officer is going to, Officer Murray is going to work with us to make sure communication is clear. Of course, you know, one of the ironies is, is that when you're dealing with, quote, crisis plans in school, there's a limit to how much you say outside the school for what should be obvious reasons. Right. So that's one of the part. We'll share the information. Uh, we won't necessarily share some of the specifics 
for what I think are, are good reasons. Absolutely, but, but like you, know, you said, you don't yeah, want to you'll hear I don't it. want to say something completely different and mess up. Yeah, yeah. No, you'll you'll of. you'll get that. Is there a plan to do um, some kind of drill, like an active shooter drill, or is that something that kind of like you? The way I, I you thought I, to I thought I actually covered it, but if I didn't, oh. we're, we have one scheduled for next fall. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to mimic different scenarios. Well, it, yeah. If you've been at the last one we did. <laughs> Again, this is not a paid endorsement for Shipley. Shipley is the only school that has allowed us to come in and actually have all the students. Typically what happens, we get an office building or a school building and it's empty. We have to try and find some role players and, and we go in, you know, we'll have bad guys and injured people, but it's limited in the, in the number of people. And then it kind of stops there. What Shipley provides us is, is that we have a full building worth of kids that we have to actually evacuate. And it, it puts us through paces that we don't normally get to do. So, and Shipley's been, we've done it here twice over the last eight years, and, and it's really been the only place we have done it. Uh, well, I didn't even mention that, but I just wanted yeah, it's to okay. the frequency, and I know you it's, mentioned the monthly fire drills. I just mm -hmm. We do, we're required by law, they're different things. I'm uh, sorry. Okay. We're required by law 10 times a year to do drills. Mm -hmm. That can be fire drills, lockdown drills, shelter in place drills, and combination. Ironically, no matter how many times you do it, the real issue is if God forbid something happens that you'd be ready for it, right? right? So that's part. And that the police department, that Lower Marion makes those resources available. I happen to believe everybody should do this. And if anybody was here four years ago, we had parents understandably, who were concerned that we would do such a thing. But we believe it's fundamentally important. Did you tell the yeah. kids? What, that we're going to do it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, they're well prepared. And, and uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They know that there's going to be one. They're prepared for it. And you have, by the way, when you go to do the drill, there are people who wind up in a situation as though it's real. And the anxiety level goes way up for some, not for everybody. And there's a balance. And there's a side, I don't want the anxiety level to be, I mean, what you want people to be able to do is however anxious they are, to be able to respond the way you want them to respond. But there's some training that goes on for the, for the police, you know, that's intense. And when I watched them, I had the privilege of being outside as I was watching them go into the building. And, and I mean, they were sweating in a way and doing it and, and treated it like, I mean, it, I don't ever want it to happen, but it makes you realize how important it really is. And by the way, you couldn't do the drills once, a, that kind of a drill once a month or once, you know, it's just not realized. Plus, it doesn't happen that way, right? But we will continue to do them. And we don't have the resources to do it once. No, no. It, once, you know, it, so. Go ahead, and the, Abby and, and, and. Thanks. Um, I appreciate that our police officers are right there, they're nearby and they can get here within minutes, but we have a security team on campus that knows our school, knows our kids, knows the buildings better than anybody else. Why are they not carrying guns? I, I, I just believe, and I'll let the captain say this, I don't believe that anybody in our, in our campus should have guns. Even I the believe, ones who are trained for I that believe, purpose? You know, you know what, here's what the studies show is that they cause more problems than they cause solutions. You know, people who have, an, and by the way, Bob is one of those people and I have the utmost faith in him, but you know, God forbid uh, somebody gets a hold of a gun in a way that's inappropriate and could grab, it's just, uh, listen, you're gonna have a new head of school in another year. That person may feel differently with the Board of Trustees. I just have to tell you is that from my own belief, the moment we bring weaponry into the school, we create a whole different level of concern. As we got to see, and Bob, this is not a comment about you, down in Parkland, we had somebody with a gun. And well, he, was, did, he was supposedly retiring. Yeah, but it does, you know, but wait a minute. I'm not going to pass judgment about him. This gentleman. He had a he gun was, and he had yeah. a right to carry the gun and nothing good came from it. And I'm going I'm to let the captain address it because we had quite a, was it last week, whenever, we had quite a discussion about this after the suggestion of having people who, you know, have the right to carry guns and those things. And I, I, I just think you open your community to the greater chance of tragedy when you do that. Uh, this obviously is 
come to the forefront a lot lately with uh, arming teachers. Um, I'm, not making a, <laughs> I'm not making a, a political statement about guns one way or another. I, I'm talking just from my experience, in my opinion, boots on the ground, training cops how to do this. Um, in theory, hey, everyone has a gun, it, it works. But it, realistically, where's my closest three teachers? All right, the three of you, I just heard gunshots down the hall. You have guns, form an assault team and go get them. I would never ask a teacher to have a gun. I, I, but, I would but, never, I never but here's, would want a teacher to have a gun. But here's I'm the problem, saying, too, yeah. with security. security. And, and again, I am not knocking private security. I am not, please don't take it that way. When we do our training with the police officers, we are not SEAL Team 6. We don't get to practice in this building for six months with a shooter in a, in a government mock-up of this identical thing so we can come in and take down bin Laden. You know what I mean? They have that SEAL Team 6 gets to do this. You're going to ask security to go into a situation where you really need an assault team. You need a, a seasoned SWAT team to go in and go after them. If if one person with a gun was barricaded in a room with kids and was just pointing the gun at the door, I still don't think it's a great idea because whoever comes through the door you, is probably going to get shot. But that aside, having security, how many buildings do we have here? Uh, five, six. Yeah. So six, let's just say well, six. We have six buildings. Six, six and, and, and the quote one here is the most complex building you'll ever yeah. <laughs> Just, and again, realistic boots on the ground. If Bob has a gun on him right now and there's something happening down in the, the lower campus and he's the only one with a gun on the campus, he's not going to have the impact. He's not going to prevent anything. Uh, and he's not going to have the impact you're looking for. So it's risk reward. Uh, the amount of time and effort you want to put into training private security, whether you want this to look like Graterford Prison or not, which I don't think you do. It's a beautiful school. I mean, that's why you're sending your kids here. Uh, aside from the education, it's a beautiful campus. Uh, so you have to balance those out. M my opinion, this, with my law enforcement experience and everything, I having an officer, having one officer here, if you want to put five armed officers yeah. in each building, now the, it, it's just not balanced with the risk. That would be a whole, thank you. I, you know, I'm saying, let, let's do this. Uh, do you want to say a few words in terms of, would you do that in that? Well, Thanks. And I'm, I'm sure Captain Thomas will back me up on this. Right now in emergency services, um, the big thing is situational awareness, and I heard somebody bring that up a, a, a couple minutes ago. Uh, how many of us are aware of, of our surroundings? You know, you see it on the news. A woman walking through the mall, texting on her phone, falls into the fountain. You know, those types of things. Guy running down the street, runs into a telephone pole. You know, granted, he was a little inebriated, celebrating Eagles win. Um, but at the same time, how many of us are situational aware of where we're at? Some of the people in my family think I'm paranoid. When I go to a restaurant, I like to sit where I can see the whole restaurant. I know where the exits are, okay? I like to sit with my back to the wall. Some way, someday some elderly person is gonna drive through that wall, I'm the first one to go because I'm sitting against that wall near the parking lot. But it's those things, when I travel, when I go to a hotel, I count the doors to the exit. So if something happens, I know where that exit is. I know where that stair tower is. I'm getting out of that building because I'm going to take responsibility for my own safety. And situational awareness is the thing. Nowadays, you know, police officers are being shot in their, in their patrol cars sitting at an intersection. Okay? Firefighters are pulling up at, at house fires, and it's a setup. You know, they're, they're having high-powered rifles fired at them. Um, EMS people, same thing. Everybody's a target today. You could, walk, you could be walking in the mall, we talked about that, or you could be sitting in the movie theater and somebody stands up and starts firing. What do you do? You know, how aware are we? How are we gonna fight back if we have to fight back? What do we fight back with? Fire extinguishers, I teach that when I teach. An ABC extinguisher, okay, the run, hide, fight. How many of you looked at that video? Not that I'm condoning YouTube, okay, tonight, something to do before you go to bed, put your computer on, Go to YouTube, type in run, hide, fight. It's about a five and a half, six minute video. Minutes, yeah. yeah, and you can you know, watch it. And that way, for those of you who are parents, you can decide whether you wanna show that to your children depending on their age. 
And those are the types of things we have to do. We have to prepare. We have not that we can prepare for everything. Uh, I teach at the fire academy, and you know, they say, you know, that some of the people there, we, oh, we have to, you know, prepare these firemen so that, you know, regardless of whether they're going to be career or volunteers, to be able to handle any any incident that's going to be out there. Well, every incident is different. Every fire is different. We could have two buildings that are that are identical and the fires can burn differently depending on somebody leaving a door open or a window open somewhere. It changes it. And the same thing if, if you have an intruder in the building. Every, all those situations are different. All those shootings, although they're similar, they're very different. And, and the outcomes have been different. And, and the uh, uh, endings have been different. Um, hopefully something happens now, but we can't be reactive. We have to be proactive. I'm very involved in codes. We're working on changing codes. Because um, basically, you can lock a building up, and, and again, you don't want Fort Knox here, you know, or Greaterford Prison. You know, you want to be a, a welcoming community here, and but there's ways you can make it a little safer for the people that are inside the buildings at the time. Because you can lock a person out of a building, but again, if somebody wants to get in, when how many times I've gotten into buildings, okay, and we leave a note for the property owners, hey, we were in here, your alarm went off, you know, it was faulty, you know, call the fire department when you get it fixed, and, and they call and say, how'd you get in? We have ways. Now, I get in the apartment buildings, just wait for somebody to leave. I get into school sometimes, because the kids open a door. You can go online, you can buy this uniform, okay? Doesn't make you a firefighter, doesn't make you a police officer, you know, but those types of things happen. You see it on the news every now and then. Matter of fact, for those of you who haven't watched the news tonight, there was an incident in New Jersey today in a school. They arrested a, did you see about it yet? No, I didn't see it. Okay. Um, the kids got warnings from this other child in the school, in the high school, that he called them or texted them or posted something to them, tagged them in some posts that, you know, wear this color shirt tomorrow so you won't get shot at school. And they made an arrest. They arrested him. He didn't even have access to a gun. This was a... Uh, a, a threat that they took seriously, the kids took it seriously, and this kid's sitting in jail right now, so you might want to catch the news tonight when you get home too and, and see what's going on with that. But those are the types of things we have to notif let our kids know, and I know somebody talked about it. Your kids can make an anonymous 911 phone call if they don't want to talk to you. Go to somebody else's phone, pick it up, dial, go, you know, go into a restaurant or you know, someplace else, you know, pick up the phone, dial 911, and make an anonymous tip. You know, if they, if they don't want to do that, hopefully they have enough courage to come to a parent or to a teacher or to a counselor to, to do that. But they should be able to do that and feel that they're not going to be held accountable, you know, and, and have their name thrown out there. And, and sometimes that's what it is. They don't want to say anything. But we should be talking to our kids, hey, you know, New Jersey Transit says it. You know, you see something, say something. Um, and let the police figure it out. That's their job. I mean, let them figure out whether it's a legitimate threat or not. And hopefully they follow up on it. I mean, in Florida, you know, unfortunately, again, you know, as Captain Thomas said, they dropped the ball on that. So we're taught, and our kids are all taught to trust uh, men and women in uniform. Thank you. So what you just raised a really scary but accurate point that anybody can buy a uniform. So a few years ago, when my kids were little, and, 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 and a few years ago happens That's to have been a long time ago. I know, exactly, and it happens quickly for those of you with young kids, it happens quickly. Both my kids are out of college already. I was in my children's elementary school to do a fire in uniform. The kids knew me, the staff knew me. I've been doing it there for years in the community where I live. And this five-year-old's walking down the hall. Excuse me, sir, you have to go to the office. You're not wearing a visitor's badge. That child knew the rules, and he was right. So I turned right around, and I went back to the office, and I got a visitor's badge. He's now the chief of police. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's probably, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 12 years old. But, <laughs> but any, he was right, and those are the types of things that we have to teach our kids. To, teach them to be aware. And if you see something that doesn't look right or see something you don't think belongs there, say something. But we are, we are telling our children, if you see something, find somebody in uniform and tell them and they'll take care of Community it. helpers, and we do that all the time. And in, in a situation around here, you know, hopefully it's the right person. I don't think someone's gonna come here in uniform uh, and, and try to get into the building. Uh, most of that stuff that's happening to that is, is homes, people wear a PICO uniform or something like that. 
And um, also here, just as a sake, you know, I, I think I agree with you, uh, Deputy, but we ask them to go to someone they know, an adult, whatever. And another so. thing about the, the awareness piece you're talking about is, and this is, this is a really good point, so you have this whole awareness concept, you know, make sure your kids or your, even you as grown-ups, know what your local police department uniform looks like. You can buy a uniform. Yeah. I get that. I get any number of requests from people from all over the place saying, hey, my husband, my daughter, my son, they love to collect patches. I never send my, my uniform patch out. You can buy a uniform from a uniform store, but those patches, unless you're going to steal it from the guys who make the patches, are my uniform specific, just like the captains and lower Marians. They have the, they have the same patch. So part of that education about what you're going to tell your kids is, this is what lower Marian police officer uniforms look like. When you see this patch, this badge, that's the guy you can go to. If you move somewhere else, you do the same thing. You go to the police department, you figure out what their uniform is, and you make that part of their, their education, their learning process. I wanted to touch on this young woman's point, and I'm going to shut up. Um, <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> these are very complicated decisions. I want about weapons in school, teachers, security folks. We struggle with it at college level. I just had a meeting with some colleagues. They're going to go armed. Not all of them, their, their chief and his two lieutenants. Other schools say no. It's a really hot button topic because we all want to do the most we can to protect and serve the communities we work in. You have to figure out what is the best for your culture it's not in, in your community and what's going to work. You know, I, I would commend, and I want to say again and again, I'm not a paid endorsement, uh, even though my daughter's in second grade. <laughs> it's a long way to go. Um, that Shipley does a lot of good things around education. I remember one of the early active shooter trainings that you had here with, with Bob and it was in the lot and I went over there and I, for years I worked across the street at Bryn Mawr. So I would come over here and look at what they do because on the college campus, doing a lockdown or a shelter drill, you know, five, six years ago is even more complicated than a K through 12. It just, you know, it's very difficult to do. But I remember when we came and they're getting ready to do their training and you, know, you have all the police there and they have their, their toy guns, as I call them, and then they had a robbery actually in the township That's right. and, and all the cops took their toy guns and put them in the trunk and put on their real guns and went to work. So the energy and effort that Bob and Dr. Pilch and Captain Thomas and all the folks here at Chipley do put into making sure the students are safe, that's real, that's legitimate. Uh, do, you, do you think they try and think a lot about it? Does Bob think about this stuff all the time? Yes, I'm sure of it. So uh, hopefully you'll leave the room. Actually, actually, <laughs> actually more, Mike. I, I know, I know. Mike, it's more often than all the time. Uh, I, I get that, I get that. Uh, and we're a little bit kindred that way. But I hope, uh, I don't know what time this event ends, but I hope you leave the room at least thinking that there's really good thought about the safety and security of the school. Are there things they could do differently? Always, and you always look forward to doing more to protecting people, but I think we're trying, and it's, it's complicated because you don't have the answers for these kind of violent episodes. And while I would say, this is my last comment, an active assailant, and we've even shipped away from active shooter to active assailant, because now you don't look at just guns. It could be knives, machetes, cars, who knows what they're gonna throw at you. That's far on the extreme and, and very rare the most devastating, but that spectrum of violence is pretty big, from a domestic altercation between two estranged parents. I worry about that stuff all the time on my campus, so we think about it, we hopefully prepare for it, but that see something, say something, that's for everybody, not just kids, it's grown-ups too. And for my community, I, I always say, and almost everything I put out there to folks, that safety is a shared responsibility. I can't do it alone, neither can anybody up there. We count on everybody else's eyes and ears to be the people that tell us things. So I'm gonna give the mic back. So that, that brings us really, you know, it's about communication and confidence and trust and having your kids or our students speak up when they see an issue, having you speak up to voice your concerns and all that goes with it. And, and Ab, to go back to your question, if you could have 15 people on this campus with guns, you'd have a chance of stopping something that would change who we are in a dramatic way and is an interesting thing, you know? And, and by the way, I trust Bob with my life, 
but I would want those people to be police officers if, if we were ever going to do it. I don't believe, as you do the risk reward as you were talking about, that that's something that's conducive to being the kind of school we want to be. Will schools make that decision? Over to, they may. But I will say this, I would feel more confident that never would I feel confident. And I love our faculty, right? They're terrific people. But never would I want our colleagues to be carrying guns. Last couple, go ahead. In terms of being aware of your surroundings, well, first of all, thank you for the emails that you sent to the whole community in wake of the Parkland shooting. And there was some helpful information in those emails about reassuring our kids that Shipley is taking, you know, has great security measures that it takes. So I asked one of my kids you know, about this and um, in terms of hiding in the classroom, they said, so my question for you is, the kids are moving around the school into a lot of different rooms within the school during the day. And we have a kid in middle school and a kid in upper school. So in every single room, are they, are they trained to know where the blind spot is? Because I, I couldn't tell. I, I don't know, and that's what I'd like so, to know. No, you know, for a few things. First, you know, to say that every kid in every adult in the room is trained to know every blind spot in every room, no, that's not realistic. But the reality is, is that in theory, uh, if we're in a lockdown situation, then there's a lockdown situation that the person locking the door knows the room, right? And by the way, if they're in a room that can't be locked, th there's passage that we all wait for them to come in. And we barricade appropriately, as recommended here, and we move out of the, out of the site of whatever doors there may be and other kinds of you know visibility sites. So I'm happy to say in that regard in this, that as Captain and his team continues to go through our buildings with us and reviewing our processes to make sure we're in place, that we're feeling uh, as good as we can that we're moving forward productively. But what that really means is maximizing the chance that the communication is good that the knowledge base is good, and that it, at least for the drills, we have a sense of being able to make progress. And we hope that no, no real situation Are the children occurs. advised on like yes. to look for where to go behind yes. the desk? Like the commons seems to be the common, know, it, the is commons a is, place because of the, the glass. Yeah, the commons, I, I think we, we says, the, the commons, by the way, has pulled our campus together in an extraordinarily special way. And remembering that it's, um, you know, our middle and upper school students who are using it. If, and they'll be trained in this as we go, if we ran into a situation that they were in a commons, uh, that we'd be looking at the run piece uh, in the most appropriate way, uh, and the fight piece, if it becomes, you know, depending on where potential shooters are in all. That's why it's building-wise situational. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure yeah. out how to reassure my kids. You know, well, what do I say? Like, if you're in a room and the teacher's not there, yeah. then you look well, for a hard surface. Right? We hope that they'll be better reassured when the Officer Murray comes to us a little bit later in April, uh, as and she's going to be uh, do a session with our lower school, our middle school, and our upper school. I think it's April 4th, have I got that date right? That, that uh, Captain, Captain Thomas and uh, some of his team are actually gonna be training our entire, or going back through and presenting and training all of our colleagues again. And he's already agreed and he's terrific to do it then. And again, we're doing the, the drill next fall, but also to help us with the ongoing education. You will, you know, uh, He's been here so often, he's almost earned a diploma from Shipley. Uh, he may get one, actually. <laughs> he's, been, he's been absolutely terrific. And, you know, will you do me a favor? Will you give both of these a round of applause? They're, you know, I, I, have, I have colleagues all over the country, and when I say that the captain and the deputy chief are willing at any time to come to us, 
they're amazed. It doesn't happen everywhere. And they are always receptive and understanding. Steve, and, and the, give me. Yes, uh, Trev. They're, they're better. And, and by the way, and though we didn't say it, Bob would tell you this, is that much of our uh, physical plant team is actually trained in any number of these areas. Did you want to say something, yeah. Adam? And that's uh, part of to Trav's point, but the school was, you were asked about an improvement, and we are improving in that aspect. We're moving away from just, oh, we hear lockdown, we're immediately doing this. And from colleagues down to kids, developing situational awareness about what's going on. The Commons and the Lark are the two prime examples. I walked in the day after Parkland to, to, to Steve's office and says, it makes no sense for us to jam a bunch of kids in the Lark into the common room, lock the door, and they're, they're, to use Captain Thomas's remarks, they're sitting ducks. It would make most sense for them to get out. So I think it's training both colleagues and kids to develop situational awareness. So the improvement for us in that instance is run, hide, fight. And run if, it, if you have the opportunity. Hide if there's no other opportunity. And if there's no other thing that you can do, fight as a last resource. Well, and it's actually interesting when you go through and uh, <laughs> Captain Thomas was good enough with one of our lieutenants and one of the other officers to spend uh, what was almost two hours with the administrative team going through the, the part. And the train, yeah, in the common room, by the way, but the training is amazing. And you, and you just realize how, how complex it really is, and you hope you never get there. What it reinforced for me is that asking the questions is most important and having confidence that we have the people from Lower Marion on all ends who, who, who are just extraordinary and are willing to spend their time with us as we do that. And by the way, our, our administrative team, you know, our, has great, you know, Bob and John and the whole group, you know, we, we sort of smile about this, not because it's fun, but we wind up revisiting this issue each time there are tragedies around the country. But that's not often enough in terms of dealing with the questions. You've got to do it all the time. Yeah, two more, and then go ahead in the back. You might have addressed this earlier, but the, um, this may, may be a really obvious question, but uh, those uh, stairs that come out of, you know, you use for fire drills that come out of um, balconies and windows, and is that it, an idea for how to get out of the second floor, or the third floor of a building here that the kids would just have one of those stair things that come? Because when I talked to my daughter, who's a 10th grader, she said, we can't leave the building because they'll think we're the shooter. And I said, no, I don't think that's actually right. I think you do, if you, you can, want to get out. So she said, if I jump out the window, I'll kill myself. So what's, what's the, what's the you, idea you, behind you, just those stairs that come out of the windows to just give the kids in, inside uh, a way to get out of the building if they can't yeah, run out a yeah, door? Go, go ahead. So, so uh, I'll give two examples of that. So the first one is, while in a perfect... In a perfect world, we'd love to think that's used only for good of getting out of a situation. One of the things we try to balance in a school is anytime we're doing something like that is what also could go wrong when they're not being used effectively. And, and that's a true example. So one of the challenges that we have here is we have glass in almost every door in every classroom in every office. While that doesn't work well for an active shooter drill, it's to ensure that any child is behind a door with an adult can actively be seen. So that's one of the challenges we have in most of our buildings, is trying to so, weigh what makes a good response to one situation may turn out to be so let not me, so good in another. So let me, let, me, let me comment on that for a moment. Is that, you know, we had this conversation countless times. I've had the privilege to be in education for 40 plus years now. And we're spending much of our time, and we have not had a situation that we know of where a student has been uh, mistreated uh, by a faculty member in any sort of harassing, you know, sexual, inappropriate way kind of door. But in that context, as Adam said, many of our doors have windows in them so that there's not the question of what could be happening as you walk by. 
And of course, the juxtaposition of that is it cre makes a harder situation in terms of people hiding in the room because there's glass. So here they are, the, the, the two, for me as the head of the school, and I shake my head, the two security safety questions that we're talking about take diametrically different sort of safety precautions to make sure good things are happening. More glass in, 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 in classrooms and doors works if you want to look into the room, make sure everything's okay. Terrible in terms of the, uh, uh, the case of a shooter, just as that way. And also, two quick questions. I think you're referring to the escape ladders from like yeah, the yeah, homes. Is that what you were referring to? So, example, and the fire marshal can talk about it as well. I'm also a volunteer firefighter in Lower Murray. Been in King of Push for almost 30 years now. But Matt can relate to, we see these in residential homes. Most people do not train with them. So, that's one problem. Two is, if you were at a higher level, second, third floor, tempting a student to try to do this would be probably disastrous. They probably would have a better shot letting the law enforcement and all those folks do what they need to do than trying to get kids out from a second or third floor who've never done that, let alone a teacher. That's a lot of training. And unfortunately, we see it all the time. People have this in their homes. They don't practice it. So here's what I'm going to say about it. When you're under extreme stress, we don't know how you're going to react. Teachers in these types of situations and our students under extreme stress which we don't know how anybody will act, is very difficult to do something that you may be mentioning about. And for me personally, my opinion, but the you know, deputy fire marshal can respond, you know, he can respond to it as well. I wouldn't think that's a really good idea under extreme stress, extreme stress circumstances, trying to have somebody put well, one of these things and escape we'll, we'll, out of a building. We'll be reviewing all of them before. And again, it's about maximizing the safety for our kids and minimizing the chance of an issue. And, it's constantly way. Hold on, Steve, and, and then um, go ahead. What's, um, the message that, what's the message we can take away from tonight? Since we obviously said we can't keep everybody out, there's going to be bad people coming in, um, which we don't know or can't stop. My daughter's concerned about that. She wonders, well, what happens if somebody gets in because the campus is vast, which is one of the nice things about it. But what's the message to, to take out of tonight? Well, I'd ask you, what's the message you heard? I mean, I, I've heard a really clear one. Adam, why don't you go ahead? heard about a school that really does an exceptional job, not just because of what's happened in Parkland, but because they've been paying attention since 9-11, since Sandy Hook, etc., and have been actively preparing. And we have a, a police force that has given us their sense of where they are. I also think this has been a great forum for people to express their fears, to get some more knowledge, because when we go home and we have children, which we all do, we need to think about how best to address them based on their age and not to take a problem because it's a human condition to take something that's a very small probability and magnify it because of your fear. Overblow it compared to the real risks and then turn your kid into paranoid if you overdo the situation. So, so my thought as a parent is that we all need to think a little bit before we react so that we can do a good job as parents for our kids and to support the school and good communication I think will go a long way for all I, of us. I appreciate that. I mean, what I hope that people will take is that first that we take this seriously. That secondly you can tell your kids that in fact, you know what? The school is really diligent about training everybody appropriately so pay attention to those drills, follow the directions, do those things and is working closely with the township, both the police and fire, that if, God forbid, something were to surface, that we'd maximize the chance that the most people would be saved. I don't know that you can do better than that. I, I, I'd like to guarantee that, whether we're looking at Shipley or anyplace else, that it's never going to happen again. But we know it probably is, and I hope it's not here. Going to ask uh, just piggybacking on that. So, um, stop, stop, drop, and roll is easy to remember from the 50s or 60s. Now, run, hide, fight is great for our older kids, but
but as one of you pointed out, it, it's really age appropriate. So for like parents who have lower school children, I think, you know, I heard a couple of people say that you're, you tell them to play dead. Well, didn't Parkland and the Orlando shooter, didn't they so specifically let's, target let's, kids who were so let's pretending not, to be dead? So is there a catch? My question everybody's, everybody's is, is there a catchy phrase for younger kids? It, it, no, not yet. But the officer will be helping us. But I would tell you that the younger the age of the kids, the more important that the drilling is in terms of following what teachers in the community are saying to do. And to tell you the truth, at the lower school level, it becomes incredibly important that our teachers be the leaders there, our adults be the leaders there, and that, as and, and the captain said this, that if God forbid something, something happens, they're going to be there with them. You know, they're going to follow the advice. That's why the drilling is so important and all that goes with it. And if you follow, I'm sorry, go ahead. There is, for the younger kids, what we teach is stranger danger. Right. So there is something for them, and, and they have some role in it that if they see. And, the, and see Officer Murray. To say something. And you may say, oh, Officer Murray is going to talk about yes. that. Okay. So stranger danger is applicable to a lot of different situations. One, la anybody else? Last one. Um, so I'm going to mention something that hasn't been mentioned, not because I think we can um, talk about it adequately, but, I, but I, I, it's what I think about, and this uh, cued me into thinking about fears. And um, So the conversation tonight is focused on um, reasonable fears, and maybe some not reasonable fears about what might happen here at the school. I probably spend 80% of my time thinking about um, access to firearms and who owns guns in among the other parents and the parents that my, my child might um, spend time with at their house. And I don't know if there's a conversation, I'm just going to mention it because I don't know how to even talk about it, but with law enforcement here, I'm, I'm wondering what recommendations for the safe storage of firearms in locked cases, ammunition separated from the, from the weapons, a particular culture, I have no idea. I'm looking at it. Wait, but I, you can't follow yet because I'm not done. But, <laughs> but, but, but not yet. So I, I don't know where a converse, that conversation might fit into a larger conversation that we're having that includes safety protocols for in the eventuality of the terrible thing that we um, are, concern us, as well as the yeah. see something, say th something about the children, about our children, about the children that may be friends of our children, anyone who might um, um, sort of appear, appear to us to be uh, an object of worry. But there's a third thing that I haven't heard anyone talk about, which is um, uh, the access to firearms, not simply maybe purchases through sellers, but also where they are in the homes of Shipley parents. So and maybe you, Shipley parents and the parents of friends of I sort of, of smile. Shipley's. Students. Uh, 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 over the now, years. Now you can follow up. No, no, uh, why don't you go ahead and then I'll. No, no, I just think that we spent so much time talking about the reactionary aspect of if something happens. So, you know, I think the mental health of our students, I feel better that we, I personally feel better knowing that there is some protocols in place for if something mm -hmm. is noticed. But to your point, what is happening behind the scenes that we could be preventing? is something I think we have to discuss further. So uh, there are people in the room who have been here long enough to sort of smile about this, not because it's a happy topic. It's been discussed many times over the years, uh, and sometimes in very public forums. And you know, it started from 9-11 uh, on up and Columbine and you know, all of the different sort of situations. And anybody will remember the Million Mom March. Does anybody remember that? It's about 15 years ago. And the school was very actively involved in that process, parents, everybody else. And um, different. this is an issue that different people have different points of view on. And, and my own place is, I'm not a gun person. I'm being honest about that. And people probably know that. There are people who, who you know, um, and, and by the way, that's not to say people who hunt or whatever. You know, that, the law is, is law. There are communities. Uh, where 
some parents get together and ask people to self-identify and then have an agreement about, you know, whether or not, you know. I would say this to you. I, I'm not going to address the specifics of that, though I'm happy for us to have more conversations. But I would say to you that your job as a parent, my job as a parent, our jobs as parents, is to protect your child the best way you can. And if you have a fear of your child going anywhere, to someone's house, to someplace else, for whatever the reason, it doesn't have to be about guns, don't let them have a play date there. I, I really mean that. You know? Now that, that raises social questions, and I understand that. But I think you want to think about that. You know, the greatest number of people I know of who, who, who have guns are the ones I know, are really careful about the things that you spoke of. But we know not everybody is. And we know that kids can get access to them. And we know that tragedies can happen. As you could hear from my response about having someone on our campus have a gun, I happen to be in the place where if I can keep my kids and myself as far away from guns, I like that. I do feel safe with the, with the captain, by the way. But my point being is that's really part of what you're asking. And you have to come to grips with that. You know, uh, we can't make it easy. You know, even if there turns out in schools to be policies, you know, those policies are only as good as the people behind them. Last one. I don't know if you were a yeah. parent here when one came and died by suicide, but it was with a gun. And we had a discussion, just like in That's here, right. about this. And after that, I started asking parents who my children, if they were going to their house, I said, do you have a gun in your house? And, if you, and there were some that, there was at least one that did. And I said, well, how do you store it? And I actually, there was another parent who said he went over to the parent's house and looked at the gun safe. So I think it's great, and I would urge everybody to ask the other parent, do you have a gun? How do you store it? Is it in a, you know, a, a thumbprint you know, safe? Is the ammunition separate? But that's, that's, that's what we did. Yeah, so, uh, you and know. It's a good reminder. I'm glad you when brought that up. When we were bringing it up, and of course, um, Cayman's death brings it up for all of us in his own way. And, you know, uh, in theory, it was a gun with a you know, walk on it that turned out not to work. And so we've all lived it. And, and she's right. We probably had 100 people here easily talking about the issue. And I think that that was the conclusion, was each person needed to take it upon him or herself and to ask what you were comfortable with. And that's sort of where we've been. And we'll reiterate that and all. Um, you know, any other last comment from anybody? Uh, it's, not, it's not the kind of topic you want to spend time on, but is of paramount importance in terms of what we do as a school and working the hardest we can to keep our kids as safe as possible. And I've often said that the easiest time to judge the school is when everything's going great. The hardest and most important time is when there's a response to something that's not good. Now look, we haven't suffered the tragedy that Parkland did, and I don't ever want us to. I don't want any other school to either. But I hope that you can see we take it seriously and we'll respond to it the best we possibly can. And by the way, we can do that better and better by having all of you work with us. The partnership that is involved with the school and everything else, the parents, is in the utmost importance when it comes to the safety and welfare of our kids. By the way, not in the extreme, not just in the extreme of, of a gun situation or this kind of thing. Think about parties. Let me ask you a question and don't raise your hand. How, uh, how many of you have kids who party? Many more than, you know, in part. Particularly, I hope not the fourth graders, but, you know, as kids, it, it, it's a, right, it, it becomes a rite of passage. How many of you, it's a rhetorical question. How many of you serve alcohol at your house for them? 
Maybe not anybody in this room, but you know what happens? You know, if your parents have upper school kids, you know that there are people who do. And will sit there and tell me, no, 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 I would never do that. Well, do you understand that if you do that, you're in much greater risk of a tragedy happening. Am I right about this, I think? And yeah, and getting arrested. You know, and by the way, this is one of the things, the ways the world has changed. When I was growing up, drinking age in Massachusetts was 18. And if you were drinking, you know, and even driving, the police officer at the time would take you home. I swear to God, it was what happened. It's not that way, nor, right? I mean, it's a totally different world. And by the way, many more cars in the road, all, all, all kinds, I'm not trying to put fear in anybody's, but the greater chance of issues in our schools and for our kids revolve around things that are not as extreme as what happened at Parkland, God forbid that happens, that we can all work better and better at. And I'd invite you to join us with that too. We have prom coming up pretty soon. Any of you have kids who are gonna be going to prom? They're all young. That's because they're all scheduling their parties right now. No. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's important because those are the situations where we see the greatest number of challenges for individual kids' health and welfare. So think about that and, and, and work with it. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that I wish I could say we would never revisit again, but we will. And we'll schedule something accordingly next fall. Uh, I know the captain and the deputy chief will be good enough to return to us. On some levels, it will be repetitive, but you'll have a clear update about where we are and the things they're recommending, which we're deeply appreciative of, and be confident that we'll continue to work at it. Thanks very, very much. Have a good night.